Welcome everyone to episode number 72 of the Broken by Concept podcast. This is the podcast where you will be educated in legal legends. We got a topic, Curtis, all right? I'm fuming, Curtis. Oh, here we go. We're going to dive going, straight in. We're going right in. You might and I don't know what we're talking about you here. Know, so no, let's, you, you gotta, the audience is, I'm blind. The audience is yeah. blind. You're the only one in the know here. We're straight in here. Okay. You might have to tone me back here, Curtis. Okay. Oh, right? wow. Or you might just absolutely agree with me. Okay. okay? You know, I'm chilling out. You know, Sin always, always like to keep tabs of what the League of Legends community is doing. Yep. Right? And then, you know, obviously the, the main hangout place is Reddit, right? Reddit, yep. Reddit, Reddit. Yep. Um, you know, whilst up there, you know, Worlds is happening. You know, everyone's getting excited about Worlds. Cool. Top post here. One of the top posts. Nothing makes me want to play League more than watching Worlds. But nothing makes me want to play League as much as playing League does. Nothing makes me not want to play League as much as playing League does. So he gets excited for Worlds. And then when he when he plays the game, he's he doesn't want to play anymore. Okay? Okay. And then there's a little caption here. I used to play this game a ton and I just stopped enjoying it. But watching Worlds every year makes me want to play. So every year I hop in and every year it feels like a worse and worse experience. Lol. Between griefers, turbo tilters, AFKs, poor champ design balance, poor anonymization, I just don't know, man. Anyone else have this? Where you want to play League and then you play and you're like, oh yeah, this is why I don't play League. Looking forward to the non-multiplayer shit that Riot puts out in the universe of League, though. So this is the comment, right? Okay. All right, my, this is my reaction, Curtis. How entitled do you have to be to think that League is a game that you can just pick up once during the year, come in, and you just get this amazing experience? You know, you you know, you go into the game, you know exactly what's going on. You know, you're you're working on some things. You know, you're, you're improving. Like, how? fucking i'm gonna say fucking entitled do you have to be from this post like reading this you know what i mean like this is not the game this is not your game right and and all it would take for him is you know sitting there thinking you know looking at um looking at all the other people complaining about it and then instantly just be able to hop, hop on that bandwagon and we know when we're talking about league, like like what's the fun part of league of legends you know it's like sort of understanding what's going on if he's like some i bet i mean he's obviously just some like silver or gold player or something right just because, I mean, Master Chip, they don't just hop into, the, like, not from our experience, right? You you play the game a lot, right? And, you know, he's just expect like, what do you expect, man? You know what I mean? Mm. What do you think, Curtis? Am I being too harsh on this guy? Just pe- calling him just right. entitled. Absolutely entitled. Well, look, I, I think that um, where we need to, I mean, there's many ways to break this down, but let's start by... First outlining, um, I, I think that he's, and look, let's, let's, let's try and take a little bit of an empathic approach, right? Let's, let's take a step back because I, I'm with you, right? That, that, that post is obviously naturally infuriating, but I think in order to really understand the psychology here, we need to, we need to take a, a more of an empathetic approach, right? right let's be let's, empathetic for this. Yeah. Let's guy. like take a step back. As here. hard as that is for so, me to do. So look, I think that. We, I mean, we've we've broken down these sorts of things before in the sense that these sorts of players, they don't really understand uh, League of Legends, like the core of the game. They don't really understand what type of game League of Legends actually is. It's kind of it's kind of like this. It's kind of like, I mean, you can't really complain about World of Warcraft being a boring game when you haven't even reached the max level cap. It's like um, the analogy I'm trying to make here is that you don't really truly know what the game is about until you put a lot of time into it. Like WoW, for this example, is, is a yeah, game a where it's like an, a lot of end game content, right? right? There's a lot of gear that you grind for yeah. and dungeons. And I mean, I didn't come from WoW, but I'm assuming that's the way it is, right? Yeah. So, so, but people expect League to be a game where you can pick it up like a Fortnite, like, like a COD, like a, um, you know, any other random cat you know random get four guys among us whatever pop in play a game have a bit of fun relax chill now i think that riot pushed that narrative though right to, to kind of be on his side a little bit i think riot do push that narrative a lot they don't really explicitly say that this is a hardcore game when it is a hardcore game leak is a hardcore game how much game. knowledge you need to have how much you need to keep playing the game constantly. It's a, it's a brutal game. And I think that 
to play the game, like for this guy, he should just play normal games. You know, these with his of, friends. Yeah, and stuff. that's have fine. Fun. Yeah, have fun. Get a few mates. Mm. Play a few ARAMs and or you flex Q even if you really want it with your mates. But normal games would give you what you're looking for out of this game. But these sorts of players, for some weird reason, they choose to play solo Q. And it doesn't really add up. Their, their actions are contradictory to what they're looking to get out of the game. And I think that they are expecting some utopian universe where they can go in, have a casual mindset... Expect everyone to be nice, happy, chappy, but also really intense and competitive at the same time. You don't get that. That's not how it works. Uh, it, you know, you, he's looking for something that doesn't really exist. Mm. So, you know, the point I was trying to make here is that, look, I can I can see why he would be confused. And I think Riot do a poor job of this. And they don't want to explicitly say that the game is a hardcore game for people looking to better themselves and to get into the details. And in order to get the most value out of the game, you've got to really review and it's not the most fun experience at all times but that's what makes league fun in a weird way the fact it's fun because it's not fun in certain that's elements. right that's it's very hard for people to grasp that because what is fun doesn't necessarily mean people get bored of fun so yeah. quick Can like satisfying like, like why do those games go in and out so quick like you know it's like the among us and the four guys like they're like fun but they just go they go they're they're fat they and they just goes. but yeah. why has league stayed so long because it's hard it's hard it's very challenging you know? and the rewards of i mean the you know in anything that's difficult the rewards are huge um so i think first of all he, he's coming in with the wrong approach and i don't really know what he's looking for you know and, well, he's looking for a reddit post for people to get behind you know in, and if you were to you know ask this guy and actually inquire and say look man okay say right reached out what are you looking for man and he would say oh it, despite all the other things that quote unquote inters, a, however often that really, like how of, really, how often does inters, and you cannot say every second game, every third game, yes, you might get the odd AFK, but it's going to balance out on the other side anyway. Yeah. Like it just really. Again, it's just their experience. It's, it's just, just them. And again, this all ties back, you know, we said this on the last episode where they weigh negative experiences more than the positives. Mm such that they remember the, th the negatives that happened to them, not that happened to the enemy team. And chances are this guy is one of the AFKs. Yes, he yeah, is one absolutely. of the quote-unquote yeah. inters ruining other people. Everyone, or no one wants to say, who, have you ever said, I am an inter and I ruin other... Who, who says that? Me and Josh do. We say it ourselves. It's like, we can't blame them because we are the inters we are on our them. teams. <laughs> I'm losing my game, we my are. team, the game all the we time. We just happen to forget those ones, yeah. though. We don't really put an emphasis on it. So yeah. these guys, you know... I think you're right. He, he does come from a sense of entitlement and, and very self... It's like a very self-centered way of viewing gaming, especially on a, in a multiplayer game. And I think that he's completely missing the point of League as a very intense, difficult game. And if he doesn't want it to be an intense, difficult game, that's okay. There are game modes that can cater for that. Now, um, my observation, and this is what I wanted to bring up, and I think it ties this beautifully, is this is why I just simply dislike reddit and even and this i think is prevalent on youtube as well i mean remember this is a post the entire community got behind and said yeah man yeah i'm the same you know get behind everyone cheering for this guy yeah and, and and look we're reading a book at the moment that slightly touches on a few cognitive biases and it touches on the psychology of humans talking about risk and trading we spread this in the last episode and one of the chapters talks about the anchoring effect and how, and, and look, I don't want to go too in depth here, but it basically talks about how humans, when they see something, that becomes like their benchmark. And then everything kind of revolves around this like artificial benchmark or anchor in their mind. So when you log on to Reddit and you look on the front page of Reddit and you see this, the title is something like, I get so excited for world. And then when I play it, I hate it. So instantly, whenever you're, even when you click on it or whatever's, the way your mind's working is, oh, yeah, I know that. I resonate with that. Like you're looking for a way to like, that is your like benchmark and you're automatically in some way, shape or form, your brain is going to be, I guess, anchored to kind of somewhat agree with that sentiment or or think back to past experiences where you have, where you do align with this sentiment. It's like, oh yeah, oh, that's oh, that's right. That yeah. happened to me then. Yeah, And so you're automatically anchored to somewhat, I guess, align with this statement and yeah. and the danger with this 
is that then you, you click on it and then you just look at the first comment. The first comment might say something, like, oh yeah, I really, that's true with me, blah, 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 blah. And then now, because everyone's, most people are just a sheep and we're just following the herd, okay, we're going to jump on the bandwagon and be like, oh great, yeah, yeah, me too, man, I feel you, fuck right, blah, 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 blah. And I swear to God, this is exactly what is happening when it comes to hating on Riot in general. I think Riot do, across the board, a pretty good job. Yes, they could be doing a better job, but across the board, they've developed a pretty good game. I would say the meta is relatively balanced with the odd little mess up every now and then. But people love to hate Riot purely because the rest of people or the, some key figures or a few people who are first in say, oh yeah, Riot, fuck Riot, fuck Riot. When at the end of the day, everyone's just following on that bandwagon. Now let's just flip the switch in an alternate reality where say the top influencers all said, I love Riot. I think they're actually doing a really good job. I am really happy with this patch. Maybe LS and all like the top Tyler one all said, Riot are great. I think they're doing a really good job with the game. Imagine how much this would shape the course of the community's response. My guess, my estimate, is that it would be a metric ton. Because this is, again, the anchoring effect in many ways. And I think Reddit is a cesspool of negativity stemmed from you're cool if you're negative and it's cool to hate and then it's easier to, to hate than it is to provide solutions. And... And when, and when it comes to content creators on YouTube, problems equals money or clickbait titles like what, you know, why Riot are ruining the game, blah, 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 blah. That's just going to get you to get you to click on the videos, click on that link. Everyone wants problems. And this is prevalent in society across the board, across all industries. You look at any financial type, if, you, if you're, if you're on the financial rabbit hole of, 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 of YouTube, mm. Why? Why you've been, the, there, you've been there down there recently? Yeah, <laughs> and why the stock market is going to crash in this amount yeah, of time? Yeah. Um, why you shouldn't buy this? Avoid this? It's just like they've been saying this for mm. months and years. It's always the same thing, time and time again, because they're just trying to push the narrative. Then you're you're anchored to that, and you're all stressing, and then you're trying to figure out a solution, and then you know. And I just feel as though we this all ties back to that last our last podcast, doesn't it? It's just like a lack of critical thinking. At the end of the day. And this guy, he's probably not the most articulate thinker who's made this post. He's not probably the most critical thinker. And because m majority of the, the, the community is also not the best critical thinkers, we're just going to jump on and turns into a cesspool of negative opinions that are highly uneducated and not backed by, you know, not well thought out arguments. So it's just back and forth. And, and it's, it, 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 there's no, <laughs> what's the point of the conversation? There is no conversation. There is no, there is no conversation. It's statement. It's statement, 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 statement. Yeah. And it's, and it's shocking. Yeah, I think it's, it's spot on. And poor Riot have to just deal with it. I wonder what they do. They just, like, what know, do they do? They just, they just look at this. They just like, ignore uh, it. I mean, they're probably desensitized to it at the moment. But I mean, I mean, you know, like we have to be critical of Riot as well. But again, it sort of needs to be, it's like, okay, what's the actual solution? Actually provide a solution. No, let's talk. No, let. I think what should first be done is let's give this, give yourself a little bit of background information. You know, tell me a little bit about your gaming history. How much do you know about games? Um, how much do you play? How seriously do you take a game? Show us your OPGG. Do you have a good quality? Like, who are we listening to here? Hmm. Who is this guy that is making this post? Before we jump to conclusions and trust this guy blindly, this could be Joe Blog off the street that tells, tells your... You mate to kill themselves in a game after dying to a level two gank. Mm. Who knows? This guy's probably some psycho. Mm. And it was funnily enough on that Reddit post, he was, I don't, I don't want to say the word, but he looked like an incredibly troubled individual. Yeah. By he, looking at his history. People were posting. saying like this guy's Reddit, like post history, yeah, look yeah. at his account. It's all messed up shit. <laughs> and it's like, we just completely disregard the fact it that this guy it. could be some serial killer or something. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. There's no verification of who the hell we're listening to mm. in it when it comes to these controversial opinions. I mean, it's and it's a pretty... That's why I try to avoid I mean, you just got to avoid Reddit, honestly. I just <clears throat> avoid it at all. Yeah, I mean, you can avoid it, but these things are happening, Curtis. Mm. That, you know, that I think it's still important to address. I mean, I'm definitely, I'm definitely much happier now. But I there are no understand. solutions to it. That's the thing. Yeah. What are the? I mean, the the only solution is that each individual who listens to the BBC are able to develop a 
a critical thinking toolkit or a way of being able to decipher who should I listen to and how should I, if I am to listen to someone, how can I make sure that I'm not falling into a, into a trap here? How can I verify my sources to mm -hmm. make sure that I'm not getting led into the wrong direction? That's essentially what the only potential quote unquote solution. And it's more of like a, a, a it's not even really a solution. It's more of like a, a, a solution per person. It's not going to solve the, the Reddit issue. Well, a specific thing you mentioned first was right to a poor job at. Oh, you mean in clarifying the intent, like the, the, the complexities of the game? Yeah. Yeah, they do. And how it's not a game that you can just, if you're playing ranked, it's not a game you can just pick up and no. then having a, you know, a quote unquote oh, But that's not coherent experience. with their business model, right? Mm. Their business model is as many people, free game, get as many people in here as possible, mm. open to everyone, all levels, all ranks, have fun, play, buy skins. So then more people, more skins, yeah. Which I don't blame them for, but they should also be a little, a lot more education with ranked specifically mm. <laughs> before you dive into ranked. Tick these boxes, try and learn these concepts of the game. Um, understand that this is going to happen. Notice how you're contributing to your the outcome of your games, you know, give a little bit of background information or point them in the right direction. The solo queue contract episode. The that solo queue contract ties back to the solo, solo queue contract. But I think you're spot on. It, you, there is a level of uh, a sense of entitlement there. It's concerning. Mm. And that's why I feel like that. I feel like that video games need to be categorized a little bit more. You know, it's like you got like, you know, the Among Us, Four Guys, all that sort of stuff. And then you have like, you know, the Counter-Strike, it's like some other word to describe that type of game. Like casual games, competitive game, but even then, competitive games are so broad. There should be even like a yeah, there needs to be a subcategory. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Because even even putting League on the same category as Counter Strike, in many ways, is doing it is is doing it un. What is the word? Is not doing it justice. Justice, yeah. Because yes, there's elements that are overlap between the rank system and how seriously people take it and things like that. But also the game just reset. You know, I, I feel like that the it whole lack true. of it's resetting aspect yeah. of League is just yeah. gives it all. It's like a different type of game. It's like Dota and League are very similar. Starcraft is actually in a way kind of similar to League in the sense that events that happen in the game you can't go back in time. Something you do in 30, first 30 seconds of that game are going to influence... Hmm. But again, that's different to 1v1 game, isn't it? That's even in the 1v1 game, yeah. So then that would be a different category. So you'd have 1v1 type games of this style. Mm. Mm. Unforgiving, snowball effect type games, however, whatever you want to call it. I think that's a good idea though. So is League just like in a separate universe? I mean, it must, must be like this for Valorant and Overwatch. Life. I'm pretty sure... It's Oh, when there's an element of snowballing in uh, FPSs with eco, the way the eco systems yeah. work and where the goal, the the money works, but you can always eco around, not spend your gold, and then you're and you lose a round, but then you're all good. It can be bad, but not as not as bad as it can be in League of Legends. It's just not on the same scale. I think yeah. it's similar I and mean, just differing levels of severity. I would yeah. say. But yeah, I think you raise a good point. And, um, anything else? No, that's it. I feel much happier now. I you feel good I, now. I understand. We're, we're Going Curtis's, to therapy session. Yeah, Curtis has, has got me back. It's like oh, okay. Yep, that makes sense. Yep, all good. You know, take a step back. Take a step back. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, I want to talk about um. I want to. I mean, I was going to talk about the anchoring effect, but I think we covered that. I want to talk about um. End of season panic. Have you been experiencing end of season panic in the Soul 2? What's been going on um, in the Soul 2? People be panicking, trying to get their final ranks, final climbs in. What's been going on? Not really. I've had some, and I've tried to tone this down, people saying that the games are like, they feel more chaotic. They're fighting all the time. I mean, I don't know. That could just be, again, a trying to create the narrative because it's like end of season, but that was always happening. Uh, yeah, I would say maybe there's a different feel I can't really describe it, but it's a feel. It's like end of season. I mean, a lot of the people that I've been um, working with, like I had one, he's like master and he's like talking about, should he change his ch champ pool to push for GM for the end of the season? I'm like, you know, don't stress mm, too much, you know, mm, just just keep working on this. Mm. Like we can assess, you know, we got, let's just go for next season, you know, because, you know, changing champ pool now. Now like is not a good weeks, idea. Yeah. Just wait to the end of the season. It's yeah. just going to fuck you up, you know? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so, um, 
So not yeah, too bad not then? for me, yeah. It's, okay. been, it's just a different feel, but yeah. people aren't panicking, I would say. Okay. I, I've had, in my MLA, I would say there is a sense of panic <laughs> uh, across the board. I think people are trying to get that final, make that final push yeah. or people that have gotten complacent yeah. and they decay and they've got to get back up. Go They're trying to make back. that final push or they want to keep that rank. Yeah. Oh, I mean, the only one, Will, is panicking. He's panicking? Yeah. Because he was sixteen, he was fifteen hundred LP, and now he's down to like twelve, twelve hundred, thirteen hundred. So right, yeah, that's that's actually we're struggling at the moment. But but he's still going to be chow. Oh, for sure. But, but it's just more he not, wants it doesn't want to finish on like he wants to finish like a good rank. Yeah, on like at least top ten or something. Right. 1500, so he's not LP. even close anymore. Yeah. So I mean, because right. he was fifteen hundred and then went down to twelve hundred, thirteen hundred. So yeah. So he's panicking, and and that's actually stressful. At yeah. The moment. Yeah. So look. I was going to say, look, at the end of the day, what we're, no, what we're seeing is a few things. We're seeing, um, like, if you have these issues, you know, they're probably not going to get fixed now. Like, you, you've left it too late. It's too late, yeah. Like, people trying to come back and get the process up and started in the last, like, month before the end of the season. Like, there's not many changes you can really make in a month to get that massive climb. Like, the work that should have been done, it should have been done by now. So a lot of people I feel as though are kind of it's like the end of exam, end of end of yeah, year, like rush. rushing, it's like just, trying to get their but you should have been in. preparing. You've already messed up by leaving yeah. it this late. You should have already, you know, if you're not getting your rank two months, it, the rank that you want to get at least two months out from the end of the season, you're probably not going to get there. No. I mean, it could, but because the stress is building up, and we know league is a confidence based game, a lot of people have just left it too late. Yeah, you know, and I'm already starting to think. Well, look, let's just leave that for now. Um, we're not going to make it this year. Let's just use the off season um, and then recalibrate, change samples, figure it out. And I, I always say this, you know, end of the off season is going to be really interesting because I've got plenty of people that, you know, I feel as though they've uh, they really wanted a particular rank and they've done things even though they, they, they've committed to a sample just because they have to get that end of season rank, even though they don't necessarily want to do it. Um, and I keep saying, just stick with it, stick with it. We'll use the off season. I think the off season is going to be interesting for a lot of people to, to kind of recalibrate, get back into the swing of things, and really set them up with success for next year. Um, are there any things that you are going to do for the off season for you as an individual player? Just making sure I'm still playing the game for sure. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if I climb a lot in the off season. And people always say as well, by the way, in terms of should I play in the off season yes. or not? You get your MMR up. Or your MMR. Go for it. And you can see, and then if you get your MMR up and you get better at the game, you're just going to be starting at a much higher rank right. than you were last season. Yeah. And I, I've always found off-season enjoyable because it's just like a less less stress, no pressure. Just get your three blocks in. There should be no ranked anxiety. Play your games in. Get bulk games in. This is And as a lot of people usually have let more time as well at the end of the year. This is go time for a lot of people. Mm. I've had a lot of people say they finish exams and this is where they want to start playing a lot. Mm. This is your time to to set yourself up success. So, I wouldn't even think about it in terms of seasons. Again, it's all about your level of play. The game isn't, you know, it changes mm. a bit. You guys adapt, but the game fundamentally, it's like, well, we could get better at jungle tracking. We could better at reading yeah, the map. It's individual you know? skills. So you can still definitely improve at the game. 100%. But yeah, I'd say like in general, like, I mean, even now, like I'm sort of reflecting on my season already, mm. you know, like I started off the season super strong. There was that Udi Hecker meta thing. And then you've gone through a bloody <laughs> journey and all. And then I sort of exploded with my champ pool, and then, um, and then I sort of been dabbling and learning at a bunch of different champions mm. like the Java and Elise and Zhao and stuff. Um, yeah, you've been, you've gone, <laughs> yeah, you've gone, you've gone many different ways. So uh, yeah, no, it was interesting. It was a good season. I, I, I liked it. It was good. Um, well, and next then, year, so is next year your year? I mean, no, we're not saying that, dude. It's just, when just, is it going to happen? Journey. When are you going to get to challenge it? No, dude. dude. It's just, it's, it's, it could take 10 years again, Curtis. I'm just, I'm just putting the pressure on you, Nate. Uh, pressure is, is a privilege and pressure makes diamonds. You are right, Curtis. Um, so, so moving on. Okay. So one, look, I don't want to go too deep on this, but I thought I'd mention it. Um, and I think we will do a, an episode going a little bit deeper on this, um, in another episode, but in the book we're reading as well, it talks about how um, the large sample sizes of players. So I want to talk about how I'm just surprised upon, you know, reading this book about risk and, and just about luck and randomness and how, um, you know, we, we get people that come up to us all the time and say, Curtis, how does X person climb? How does this person get high rank doing this? Um, when I watch this player, 
they are able to do this and climb and we got all these questions. We, sometimes it's hard for us to answer. We're like, well, yeah, they're actually kind of doing things wrong and their process doesn't make sense. And um, yeah, they aren't, aren't, they aren't, what they're doing isn't really sustainable, but they're getting results. And this really confuses people because they, these people could even be people they look up to, role models. We're talking the Tyler ones, the processes, the streamers that spam 15 games in a row, people who play these weird champ pools and get away with it, like Vlad one tricks and stuff like that. And although they are great to watch in order to get like a different perspective on things, what he, what this guy Nassim Taleb spoke about in his book is how when you have a massive, massive sample size of people, let's so he in the book talks about traders and he spoke about how, um, and I'm going to actually use the example he spoke about. So he spoke about, let's say we have a um, hundred, okay, well, we're going to use a small number for now, but look, we can see how this could easily get extrapolated. Let's say we have a hundred fund managers and let's just say, um, 55% of them are actually going to lose and go negative in the first year. And 45% of them are going to, are going to win and going to make money. They're going to make some form of money. So let's say we weed out that the, the, the 55% that didn't make money. So we're left with out of the hundred, 45 left. Actually, let's start with even, let's actually start with a thousand. So there's 450 left, right? And let's keep that, those odds again, 55, 45, and then we take it another 45%. So two years in a row, we're going to have, um, you'd have 45% of 450. I don't have the math, I don't have the math off the top of my head, but you have a, a, a now after two years, two years in a row, a bunch of these fund managers would have made money two years in a row just by luck. Even if they were still by chance deemed to lose, but they just got lucky. Like they just got lucky two years in a row now. And then again, we take 45% of those people just got lucky, even though the market they should have technically lost money, but there's right place, right time, luck again. After three, four, five years, you can still have these fund managers that on paper, what they were doing doesn't make sense, but they will still make money because they're just right, just luck again. But there's a small series of, there might be like a handful now out of a thousand. There could be say like 10, 15 left, 15 left of these fund managers that have made money four or five years in a row. And then the newspaper starts to make articles on them. They start to get interviews. Everyone tries to buy into their fund. And then they ask some questions. How did you do it? And they start to make up some elaborate thing. Like, this is you how know, I did it. my morning ritual. And they start to they go into all this, <laughs> all this shit that these guys do, right? And then we look up to them. We idolize them. And then what happens? Everyone starts to try and copy them. Mm. But none of them are even aware of what they've done is largely just luck. Mm. And because when you've got a... Ma and this is only a thousand... In league, we have millions and tens, hundreds of millions of players. There is going to be, even if what they're doing isn't sustainable, and even if it was like just what they were doing was completely unsustainable, there's going to be a handful of them each year that just so happen to make make it work, right place, right time, right champ in the right meta, just happen to play the right amount of games. You can get a lot of luck in a certain in league in a lot of different areas, right upbringing, all these scenarios boom, get a little bit elo, get a little bit of confidence, get a following, start to ride that hype, right place, right time. And then we look at them three, four years later on and be like, oh, oh how'd you do it, man? They look at this guy and people idolize this guy and start to copy this way, the way this guy got his results. But largely, it's just fucking luck. It's just right place, right time. It's the process suited him, him and only. And even what he was doing isn't sustainable, but he just somehow makes it work. Just by, and we won't even, we might not even ever know why it even worked, but it just doesn't work for anyone else. So when you have a huge sample size of people, how, we can't determine what is luck and what isn't luck. And, on, and the only thing that can, that can filter through the bullshit is time. Time is the true, true test of success. Every single year, someone is reliably at high elo. That is the true test of process. That is the true test of success. If someone gets high elo for two, three years, four years, it's not enough. Luck. And we've seen this already by heaps of players that are weeded out. Weeded out every year. Players that are weeded out, weeded out, weeded out. Faker is an example of one that stood the test of time. He's one that probably has a really solid process and has a, a really structured way of doing things. And has you can't say it's luck with faker you just can't say it's luck but what i'm getting at here is that 
we're so bad because no one talks about this. No one talks. And even Nathan, largely our entire career is just luck. Absolutely. Right D- place, right was time. Right place, right time. Nathan, me finding League when mm. I did was just luck. I just happened to click on a browser. Mm. What I did wasn't sustainable, but I just had a Counter-Strike background. And before that, like all these ga- cargo gaming background, I just happened to pick the right role at the right time, hang around with you at the right place, right school. Like it's just, just all luck. Mm. But, you know, I don't talk about luck and I probably should talk about luck. A lot of what I do is like, and now what we're trying to do is figure out how can we cut through the luck? How can we create our own luck by really getting into the details and doing it in a non-sexy way that is slower because the fast way we did things i mean it caught up to us eventually right i mean yeah, what we did back then for sure it caught up to you really fast yeah. but but we've had to adapt our strategy but what yeah. i'm getting at here is that we see these people that get insane results as well even like just everywhere even with our with our coaching sessions some people, I would say, are largely lucky. They may, may, may take one or two things away from our coaching. Some people, they get these insane results. I would say a lot of them, it's not all because of our coaching. No, absolutely Maybe not. a part of it, yeah. but that's only one element of it. <clears throat> so I'm not saying we're completely useless, but mm. what we're trying... What I mean, what it feels like I'm doing right now is, okay, how do I determine? How do I go through all this mess and then determine, okay, what's actually replicable for people to get results Yeah, and what's not? And I'm going to own up to it. Like in the past, the way I got results was not sustainable. And mm. the way most people you're going to ever watch, the way they got results is not sustainable. Mm. And I think this is really important to just, and I love that analogy, the way he like he used this example. Even if 40, 45% of the time you're going to be successful in that year, there's still going to be the lucky people. What are your thoughts on this? And when your sample size is again that big, it's like, it's just, that's the key thing it's the sample there, size there could be people doing it right but you just don't you don't know, know. you just don't, you don't know. know and you can't determine with who is doing it right and who isn't now again the only other way of testing if the sample size was really small let's just say you had a sample size of 10 and then over that 10 there was one that got success like 5 years in a row mm. even if it was like 45% or something like that then that guy's actually doing something well like the chances that out of a sample size of 10 that one guy is reliably doing well, then you would trust that guy because like, there's not many, there's not many people here. So you can't, you can't hide. It's very, it's very unlikely there's going to be a not an anomaly within a less, less people. So, but when the sense. league player base is so large, we can't determine. Mm. We, we just don't know. Mm. And in a way, the point of this statement, why I wanted to bring this up is that, you know, this all ties back. And again, we're going to tie it back and tie it back and tie it back. And I think the theme of this month is critical thinking in a, in the sense. It's like you cannot blindly trust anything that you hear. And um, we're still, we're even, we're still trying to figure it out. And I love getting feedback from our clients. Um, do, you, do you get feedback from your clients and your, on your coaching? Like, do they give you feedback? Like, oh, like this just doesn't work. Like, no, I'm just perfect. No, of course. Yeah. yeah. The, I mean, recently someone's been more critical thinking about, you know, playing a lot of games in lower ELO versus three blocks. Right. And, um, that was with Varun, I think. And then, um, yeah, throughout the year, I've had some people with that, you know, success. most of the stuff about the three block stuff, people can have success with not doing it. Um, but then there's dangers. Yeah, that's yeah, right. So it's like you, you, know? can, you can definitely do it, but it's But then dangerous. I've had people with success with it as well, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, um yeah, there's just in one as well. I some sometimes I get these people that join Soul Two, and then we had one session, and then their first one, right? And we like focus on like one thing, right? And then they go in and like, yes, this coaching's amazing. I'm just like, look, I was like, okay, like, settle down. Let's just settle down. <laughs> you know, like I don't want to, you know, like pro, you know, prop myself up here, but you know. And then it's funny that guy now is he's, he's struggling and booming again. Yeah. You know, it's like. Yeah. That's that's a great example. It's a great example talking yeah. about you know like that's that's a bit of luck. You know, it's like like maybe it's a placebo effect. It's like I just got coached, so I must just be better, or like I'm getting him to thinking, start th- actually thinking about. The well, game. I I am. This is a terrible thing to say, and I I got, I got look. We we say no bullshit here, on the BBC. Yeah, that's right. And you're worried about what I'm going to say. Oh Jesus! But it's just true. I got to highlight it. Yeah, I would say. What percentage would I give here? Seventy-five percent mm. of the results that no, seventy percent of the time a player gets results from a singular coaching session is purely from a placebo effect. Yeah. 
Hence why one-off coaching sessions, even if they somehow immediately get short-term results, are just a recipe for a disaster. Mm. Whenever I see any other coach on the internet do one coaching session, and then I did one coaching session with this guy and look at him now, fuck off. Yeah, I, that doesn't even mean anything. To doesn't me. mean anything to me. It you, might have been, it might it, setting him up, but it, could it doesn't have, mean anything. But it, it, the, the, again, we can't determine mm. between the noise and what's real. We mm. can't, can we? Mm. It's one, one session, mm. bro. Like one session. Well, it's interesting with the interview that I posted on my channel with Ishan, that was the, the guy that went from gold to, to master tier in yep. one year, right? Um, Congrats, Ishan. He, you know, looking at things, because what I was trying to get into interview was like, what are the long-term sustainable things? And he, I mean, he stuck to the three block, one three block a day for the whole year, right? Yep. Um, and talking about things in terms of like, he had to, like chip away at like invisible and it's like over time and and the community aspect like reviewing with some other members and um you know watching streams like there's all these things that are like long-term-ish things little little things that are that, that that you have to chip away at over long periods of time and it's just like you know i'm, I'm, I'm basically what i was trying to do there was trying to remove all the randomness in his process to be like okay well what actually worked over a long period of time and it's like, again, these things in like the community aspect of the soul too and stuff. So, um, yeah, that's, that's someone, again, you might think that Ishan's lucky, right? Like he, he did play Eve. He did like one trick, but he's still like following things, you know, like, well, mm. that's a lot of what we mm. preach and what we say. Right. Mm. I want to give you an analogy for this one that I, I'm going to steal it from the book okay. that I thought was beautiful for league. Mm. So this is why I think there's so many parallels between trading the financial market markets versus league. Yeah. So what so is your currency the LP? <laughs> no, this is this is this is spicy. Okay. So so what are the two things that we know that the, the, the commonality between these two is that things always change. What do we know about the markets? Well the world's always moving. The the world's always different. We the, it's it's moving at a rapidly fast pace. And the stock prices or prices of everything gets reflected based off what's what's happening now at this second in this moment this business and this this in trillions of interactions and interconnections between all the businesses and the worldwide economy global economy to create the prices that we reflect in the market right now in league what do we also know i mean the, the game is changing all the time not just on patches but people solving the game is always like it's like a building blocks it's like Okay, a new patch comes out and then there's like an iteration of the meta and then a meta to that one and then adaption to that meta. And then it's just, everyone's just building upon the the constant changes to the game and, and people play the game differently because people realize certain things or certain ways of playing the game is more effective, right? Yeah. And certain like items make champs strong. It's like the whole shield bow thing. And the yeah, they will count a shield bow. Yeah. I mean, there's all these, it's a never ending cycle, right? Mm. So if you're not getting better at the game, at league you're actually getting worse because everyone else is getting better naturally even if they're not they're trying to playing. get better they're just playing they're just in the environment they're just in it right yeah. so the analogy he uses then what these theorists of financial markets did and these mathematicians they were always trying to view the like the markets as though like imagine like an urn right you got like this bowl and then there's red and black balls and let's say i said to you you don't know the percentage of how many balls are in here right and let's just say i knew and let's just say inside this urn there's um, 50% chance of picking a, a black one and then a 50% chance of picking a red one. Now, um, as you dip your, you're going to pick out a black and then you're going to get this ball. And then, it, and even if I told you how many um, balls were in this urn and what the percentage was, you know, you still don't know, like you, the, as you pick up, say three black balls in a row, you would know that the chances of getting a red one is more likely because there's only certain, so many balls in there. But the analogy he used is that every single time you take one out, there's more balls getting added in of random colors because mm. it's always changing. Mm. Mm. So you can't ever know what you're going to get out and what, because the ratio of the, of them is actually just changing every single time. And what I've noticed in league is the same thing. Just because you learnt one thing on one day, like it's just one thing and the game is just different. And that might that learning might not even be applicable in a few weeks from now. And like the way you approach that skirmish could be different because the items change on the champ's identity is different. 
Like you got to always, you got to be a constant student of the game. And I think that, I, and I love that mindset. It's like, well, if, if the game is always changing and everyone else is also getting better, just, that's just one review, one little detail. You've got to get, add it on, add it on, another one, another one, another one. It, it does. It's a nonsensical to to have results get massive results from one session given, or sustained results. Given how complicated the game. Given how complicated like, and how say, often it would change. Let's say if you're learning piano, it's like I learn how to play this part of the song. You can get that 100 percent of the time once you've learned it, right? Mm, mm. But the league's different. The financial trading market's different. Yeah, yeah. Um, sorry, uh, something came to my head. So, um, so I got I got um. Remember that tweet that I did? Which one? Because you've had a lot so of I did, I, I did tweets. a tweet that got like, it was really controversial. I did yeah. a tweet like, I think it was like a week or two ago uh, about how I didn't, I didn't know, I didn't understand how um, someone could be a challenger coach in multiple roles. Yep. And I don't remember like a lot of the responses because I just tuned out. Like I, it wasn't going to be a productive conversation. And then um, there was, and then I used an analogy of how, okay, if you um, if you if you're coaching now an, a, a, an Aurelia 400 LP Aurelia one trick, and this guy comes to you and they, you start to get into the matchup, you look at one game, maybe it's an Aurelia versus like I don't know Furotop. You start to get into the details and you you start to get specific and you start to like review that game, and then you got another coaching session. Next one, mid player this time TF versus Rise. And then you got another one. You got to coach a jungler. Rengar, jungle one trick, 300 LP master. He wants to get to challenger. You got to help him, this guy. And some of the feedback from what people said was, yeah, it's possible. You can just like draw back on past experiences. And like, cause you know, you know, I've played these roles at different seasons and like, you know, the matchups don't change that much. So like, think, you have the fundamentals of the you game. Yeah, the fundamentals of the game. So you just get it. And like, I've really dwelled on this and I thought, am I wrong? Like, am I just wrong here? Mm. Like, am I just really missing something fundamental mm. here? Like, am I that delusional that I can't see what's going on? And, you know, I've taken my time to think about this. And like, I get where these people are coming from. Like, I, I, there's no doubt you can help someone, right? At a fundamental level. Like, even if you don't play Rengar, like, I'm sure you could point him in the right direction. Give him a little bit of advice. If it's got to do with the jungle, yeah. If it's got to do with the jungle. I mean, that yeah, you're a jungle coach. But I'm even saying within the... As a jungle coach, like... If you if you don't play that champ or you don't really know yeah. specifics about the champ, you, sometimes it's even hard to help them. Like yeah. yeah, I struggle to coach Graves and Kindred players. Yeah, even if you might know a little bit about them, you can give them some general advice. But at that level, at a challenger level, like the details and the specifics like matter a lot. And I think where, you know, and I think this is something that Nathan, we, we, we kind of introduced in the first topic here, which is the Reddit post is like, you got to realize that the, these people, um, they, they don't really understand. You're not, you're not, you're not actually having the same conversation. So when you think of a maths problem, right? Say we're trying to both figure out the same maths problem. Well, it's very simple because like, all the information's in front of you and we all see the same thing and it's just the same formulas. But when me and Joe blog on the internet here are trying to talk about coaching, when I think of coaching, I'm thinking, okay, the, the, the game is constantly changing. Mm. Details are really important and that game, the, the game is patched every fucking two weeks. Mm. And yeah, I might know a little bit about that matchup from X season, but in my experience, those details really matter a lot, at least climbing myself. Like I can't just skip over those specifics. Otherwise I'm just- Fighting people with certain items. Yeah. And like just my mindset, like knowing the right mindset in a specific matchup, in my mindset, certain champions in certain matchup differs based off your interpretation of the matchup, like all these things. It's like, these are all these things that are running in my background when, I, when I'm about to answer that question or when I throw out that tweet. But when someone else is replying to that tweet, they're actually not- like they're coming from a completely different plane. They're coming, like they're coming from this, like if we look at the same problem, like the some mass problem, they're looking at it from like a chemistry background or some like crazy background and trying to solve it through first principles. And I'm just looking at it from like plug and play this formula. We're not even having the same conversation. We're actually just not even having the com same conversation at all, are we? And so what I've realized is like, you know, I think that, there's a lot more 
to everything in league than I've when I've when I've realized. There's actually a lot more to everything, and and I think that your content, you know, with the whole Ishan that that video. My point I'm trying to make is that we still don't know jack shit about what gets results. Like we have a hunch certain things work, but if we knew, if all these people knew what got results, right? Just it was all clear cut formula stuff. Why not just put it on a PDF file and send it out to all the the junglers? If it's all just fundamental stuff, right? If it's all just the same concepts, plug and play a PDF file, make one video. If everyone watched that video, given it's all general holistic stuff, wouldn't everyone just get results then? Like if this is all holistic advice that gets people to challenge her, couldn't you just make a video, summarize all the holistic advice that someone needs to do, plug and play? Like, am I missing, like, am I missing something here? Uh, like I, I'm trying to say, I, I don't see a world in which the details don't matter is what I'm saying. And like, it, b- because, it, cause so you couldn't make a PDF or a video because it will be, there's so many things, tens and hours. And it's going to get outdated in, in a, a month or two months or three months. So what I'm getting is that everything is more complicated than what I thought it was. And then when I'm having conversations with other people about the game, they think the game's just super simple. Yeah, well, if Everyone I th- thinks the game is so fucking simple. If, if I think about the yeah the details in terms of the, the change this season, the two-minute jungle kept to 2.15, right? Um, you used to be able to snag their gromp if they were able to... If they... If you did like a handshake crab and stuff oh, like that. because the know? jungle spawn times were different. Yeah, like, you know... Because they're fifteen seconds sooner, you yeah. feel like usually you could just take it, but yeah. now you can't really do that. Like you sort of just like need to reset and then they go to your gromp, or whatever, right? Right. That's like a huge change. That's huge. It's huge. Because you're you're now not spending the time patch. to do something. Yeah, that's one patch, and that's that's actually completely changed what you'd usually do in that situation, right? So if you're not a coach that is constantly trying to like learn the game, like constantly get into the yeah, details. like let's say if that change happened and then this person didn't play jungle for like a month after, you are going to have a different feel for the game. You're going to be lost. The feel, yeah, the, yeah, the whole yeah, thing's different. The story, yeah. Yeah. I mean, maybe if you played other roles, you can have a feel, but no, you won't because you're not getting the Gromp, dude, if you're mid lane. You don't even, no. you don't even fucking know that. No. <laughs> you know, I know you, jack you, shit. You ever knew that? No. <laughs> Playing mid lane? It's like, oh, I, no. I got to push this wave because he's, he's taking his second Gromp. Because the other the new jungler showed on the other side of the map. Yeah. So look, look the point of what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is I'm trying to just like level up my yeah. level of critical thinking. That's yeah, what I'm I trying mean, to do. I'm trying to like it's, really. It's hard to argue. Yeah. I mean, there's... like I'm trying to really like take a step back here and I, I'm like, what am I missing here? And one of my favorite quotes is like, if you really just put their advice into app, like, what would it mean if 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 my side were true and their side were true? Like, what differences would we see in the world? Like, if if it really was that easy to get to challenger. Why don't we see multi-role challenger players all the time? It's very, very rare you see a multi-challenger player. Yeah, it's true. Very rare. Yeah, right, yeah. Someone that is like genuinely challenger level at multiple roles, mm. it's it's rare as fuck. Mm. I mean, how many people know that a multi-role, like multi-role challenger? It's like two, maybe. Yeah. Maybe, even if that. Mm. A genuinely multi-role challenger. And those are really good players. And this, I mean, and, and, and I think that's that, but also, okay, if it was really that easy and if you could just break down and teach them how to think, just make a YouTube video, send an email around to your company with your PDF. Mm. <laughs> Everyone's challenger, guys. Yeah, no. It just, I just don't get it. It's like, yeah, I, I, I'm trying. Like, and, and look, you know. I mean, the, the thing about that as well is like. You're, you're so, you're, Nathan, you're coming from the say that we can't ignore Reddit. Like, I'm trying to not to ignore these opinions in the public. Because we yeah. got to. What do I mean? we got to cri- criticize ourselves. Like, yeah. is what we're saying is bullshit? Like, is the game really that hard? Is it that complex? Like, are we over exaggerating things or are we wrong? You know, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Are we, are we just wrong in so many areas? Well, talking about relatability as well, it's like. Let, let's say let's say if you're the person who was that Rengar 300 and then what he felt, what he did, going from 300 to 700 LP or whatever, that's really good advice to that person who's in the exact same position. Like mm. one of the things that I, I stated with Ishan is that um, why I wanted to do that is like, because people can relate to his journey. I don't, I can't. I didn't you can't, do that. Yeah, you haven't you haven't done that exactly. I didn't have journey. a full time job and I didn't go from gold to master, right? So so his his experience is actually more valid than a coach in a way. Yeah. Isn't it? He's actually probably more 
he has more merit to coach someone on that journey than you. Yes, correct. In a way. Yes. Because he knows what it feels like. Yeah. Hence why being challenger or high elo as a coach is also important because you've got to know the feel. What does it feel like to climb from D1 to master? What does it feel like? What sort of the game feel what like? What are the challenges? What are the, the narratives in your head? Like, Yeah, what problems do you face and how do you tackle those problems? Yeah. Like when you get that person who does this in that game, what is your response? How do you tackle with it? Yeah, I think you're spot on in a way. Yeah, I actually think you're spot on. I, I, that's an interesting way of viewing it, isn't it? He's in a way got more merit to, yes. to coach that. Yeah. I've literally been shoving off some of my gold Evelyn players saying, go talk to Ishan here. Like he'll help you out, you know? Because he can, he can like think back to that moment, what it felt and like. he'll be super efficient. Like I would, like I can obviously help them, but I have to like look at their gameplay, go over some fun, but I might be missing, like this might not actually be that important compared to what he focused on there, you know? And you, again, if this is true, that means you would be the best at helping someone go from master zero LP to 100 with Jarvan. Yeah, basically, yeah. Right? Yeah. Or, or, or something like that. Or maybe more frequently because I was diamond last season, going from diamond to master. So with certain champions as well. Like, it would again, obviously diamond to master, but yeah. like with even with the champs that you did it with, it'd be even better, oh, right? It'd be so easy to do it. be so easy. Yeah. I mean, when so you... what was it when you first went from diamond to master? Or like even that, that, that time we're talking about? You did it with like Rudy and stuff, didn't you? Or was that before that, after that? No, that was like with Nunu and stuff. That was like last season, but that was in the off season. Right. So, yeah. so if someone Nunu player said, "How do you get from Diamond One to Master?" You would nail that. That's right. right. That'd be so, so easy. easy. Yeah. You just know exactly their problem. And I'll be better than any other coach by far. Yeah. No matter what, yeah. because you just can I did completely it. I resonate. Did it right? Yeah. So, so think of it again from that aspect, right? You're just a better, you're just better, because you better. You just know if you did it. You just better if you did it. Yeah. You can't argue with that. No. Like the logic is too sound. Yeah. So that's the way that I I'm, I'm thinking of it more now. But then the but then the but then the argument uh, the 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 uh, flip side to that is well it's unrealistic for one person to be in every single scenario. You know, like you're you're not going to be able to resonate with everyone's climb. Like you got to somehow distill the key learning from that. Yeah, that's my job as a yeah, coach. Your yeah, your job is to like distill the main learning yeah, and then like still, apply that. Again, I still reckon I can do a good job, but again, there's people that... There's levels to it as well. There's levels like, to it, yeah. Like, he's that next level. The level of efficiency and also relatability. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I feel you. And also, people are generally more inclined to listen to someone... And even just the role. ...who's relatable. Just the role. Yeah. Yeah, the role, the role's like, so it's like role. The role is champions. just the number one, then the champion. Yeah. Or like role, then rank, then champion. No, I'll build it up actually. It's more role. And role then is the foundation. Foundation. And then champs, like the second one, and then rank. Yeah. Something yeah. like that, right? Yeah. In terms of the, the, the relatability. Yeah, relatability. Focus. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's important. It's possible to be is, is super relatable and in touch with, hence why we got to play solo queue. Like you can't, you can't just sit there as an armchair analyst reviewing VODs all day and not playing solo queue, you just become so detached. That's right. You become you so be detached from yeah. reality. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to talk about what Joe Life said to you, Nathan. Okay. So Joe Life sent you uh, a post. A so let me, message. let me, I want to take the reins yeah. on this because I, I, I need to frame it at the beginning all first. Right. Okay. Um, let me frame this. Frame it up, Nathan. Um, where is it? Shit. Did I send it to you on Discord? You sent it on Discord. Yeah. yeah. All right, so I'm going to start by framing it. So we love narratives and breaking down narratives, right? And we've got to think about the cycle. So it's everyone, you put guys your narrative cap this, on. Put your narrative cap on, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and let's approach this from narrative cap let's, time. Let's break it down, okay? Yep. Detectives time. So Jolaf here, he's uh, my my famous Olaf player in the Soul 2. From I most? A, I did a, yeah, from most. He did a four hour video with him, his Grandmaster. And he's been struggling with this narrative. So he said, the narrative that's popped up this season is season 11 master players are Diamond Force season 10 players. That's the narrative. That's the narrative. So season 11 master... Currently, like last season, they'll Diamond Four. Okay. And that everyone is ELO inflated. It seems widely believed on Twitter. And game quality is far worse this season in Masters Plus. We'd love to hear about this on BBC. So what's the narrative? What's What's going on here? People are elo inflated in yep, high elo. Inflation. So let's let's say diamond players. Are, so people that have. So let's break down diamonds. specifically. What does he mean? So he means that. So if you were playing at that exact same level of play last year to this year, you would be master tier four tiers higher. Yeah. 
Yeah, so if, if you're if you're if you don't improve at all, you're diamond four. Last year, you instantly got mastered. This year, <laughs> okay. So why are you laughing at already, case? I mean, it just seems so ridiculous to me. Diamond four to master. So you're saying Nathan, because you were this is something you could resonate with, right? Because you were diamond four at times last year. Yep. You should be the expert on this one. Was you playing at a D four level last year? The same as playing. You're playing basically master tier now. Yeah. Is that the same level of play? No, no way. No, no way, way, right? No, no. no way. No. Was there a little bit of global ELO inflation? Yes. But that was, they removed Diamond 5. They removed the fifth tier. Have you re- People f- somehow forget this, that they removed the fifth tier of every rank because they wanted, they wanted it to be more, like they pushed more people higher ELO. Hence why... The challenger highest ranks now are way higher. Oh, yeah. One thousand LP this season is not one thousand LP last season. Mm. Hence, why you got eighteen hundred LP in NA at the moment. Yeah, the, it's a broke the record. Is because general stuff. Because think about it, they removed the the tier. They yeah. removed the diamond five or whatever. No, but they didn't remove that last season, Curtis. That was like three seasons ago or something. Was it three seasons? ago? <laughs> yeah. I want to see when they did. Curtis, you're discon- because I'm pretty sure they did something like that, or they re- or they added they added something where because I, I saw this somewhere they did it on purpose. A sleeping they removed, made t- they removed the promotions. Oh, they removed promotions? Yeah. That was it. They yeah, did something. Right. Yeah, sorry, it was that right. and yeah, the yeah. promotions. Yeah. Well, so yeah, the promotions, because they did it on purpose. Yeah. And I don't remember sleeping or something made a tweet about it. It's like, why is everyone complaining about Elon inflation? Yes, the, the cap of the L the LP uh, has risen. Yeah. But the, the 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 ratios are the same. The ratios are always the same across the board, but the like people, it's like it's like something's changed. Yeah, so you don't have to play a, a promotion series at all. They remove that. Right, yeah, yeah. So, so you still have to play what? So it's D4 to D3. You would have to do a promotion. But now yeah. you just go bounce in and out. Right, so out. think about it. There's less games. So that's why the LP gains are also lower. Mm. People complain about lower LP gains than what they were last season as well and things like that. You get like plus like 12. People complain about like plus 14 and stuff. But you got to remember there's no promotions. Mm. So there's a combination of a lot of things there. But across the board... Yes, the LP gains were a little bit weird, but you got to remember, zero LP master is not the same as zero LP master last year from a straight like level of play. It isn't. It's not the same. They're, they're, Elon Vision is right in some aspect, but not to that extent. Yeah. So I would say, you know, I would say, well, because 1,000 LP, one uh, last season, not, not the same in terms of level of play. Um, there's people that are 1,000 LP in Oris right now that wouldn't... I mean, even if they've improved, they are not... It's not the same. Um, so I would say there isn't a, a, a push-up, though. So I would say a, probably a, maybe a 200, 300... Maybe a 200 LP push-up at max. So a D4 player would then go to D2, D2 D1. I would say that's... Yeah, I would say that's relatively accurate. So the narrative's right, then. To a certain extent, though, but not really because the... It doesn't really matter the grand scheme of things because that was just their... Because the level the thing of play... About ranking, just ranking. Ranking is just a... a bo- it's like it's just like a thing on top yeah, of the Yeah, your rank doesn't matter. It's like, at the end of the day, it's like... Well, I mean, Master well, Tier is top 300 in our server. Well, what, what... So, Master Tier, the way you got to view it is like every rank... Okay, this is a better way to frame it. Rather than looking at the rank, think about what the rank represents. So, so back in the say, so let's say, let's take let's say a benchmark. Let's say zero LP master last season. Like if you played a lot of games in it, you would kind of get a, a vague idea of what the level of play was. If you were somehow transported in the future, the exact same rank, just you just got placed in master to zero LP and played the game, you would feel as though the game was a little bit easier now so what would happen is that you would you would go up a little bit maybe you go up to like master tier 100 200 something like that and then you would kind of settle there right but that just means it's not like that master tier's really changed that much it's more like the, the the degree of difficulty has shifted up a little bit in certain aspects in certain in certain areas you know um, so you've got to get high Relo, which is, I mean, and at the end of the day, none of it really matters. No. 
like none of it really matters. If you're, at the end of the day, there's a ranking system. There's rankings in terms of actual numbers. I don't even think about the ranks, right? Like, like the, don't think of the number. Think of the rank. Yeah. yeah. And don't think of 200 LP. Just think of the, your master tier or grandmaster or, no, or, or challenger as well. You should think of it like that. Or your rank X on the server, right? So, so it, it doesn't even matter. Yeah. It doesn't even matter because like, you. It's a competition, and there's like rank one, you know, rank ten, rank fifty, rank hundred player, rank two hundred player, like. You're as good as everyone else, and yeah, yeah. It's it's always relative. It's it's not it's not like you got to remember that master tier zero LP isn't like a fixed level of play. No, yeah, that's the yeah. thing. That's what it's I'm trying to get. It's always changing. Yeah, it's always changing. It's always changing. Yeah. So people are like now de- like because it's, de- it's a defense mechanism, right? Like obviously they haven't gotten better because in, remember the narrative: no one gets better at League of Legends. No one that's gets right. better. No yeah. one. You're, you're either, either talented, you're either good or not. Yeah. Right? That's the narrative. That's yeah. the real narrative at play here. Yeah. That's the overarching narrative across the board that Olaf or Joe Life is getting influenced by is no one gets better at the game. So if someone actually if gets you're better... you're a Diamond 4 player, that you're permanently Diamond 4. And if someone actually gets better than you, it has to, it has to be the rank system. It can't That's be. Right. This yeah. guy can't get better. It breaks the narrative, right? So you, he, Joe Life's gotten better. So people are cr- critical of him, right? Because mm. holy shit, he's actually, he's actually gotten better. Wait, mm. what? Someone gets better at League of Legends? Mm. How's this possible? Mm. Right? So he's gotten better. And then... Obviously, yes, the, the system has removed promos and things like that. So there's a little slight increase, whatever. And then um, they're going to push that narrative. The people that haven't improved are going to push that narrative really hard because they're thinking about what that LP meant last oh, year. Sure. And it's they're like, gonna, oh, it's not the same. It's not, it isn't the same. You're yeah. right, man. Yeah. So get better. Yeah. Get better. Get higher. If you're the same as zero LP both seasons, you know, not good. So I think, yeah, there's... I mean, everyone's trying to drag you down. This is what you also got to realize, Joe. Yeah, yeah. Everyone is trying to drag you yeah. down. Trying to belittle your achievements. Because everyone... Trying to drag you down. Especially in high elo. The, yeah. the high elo community is an incredibly insecure place. Yeah. Egos are running rampant. Mm. Everyone's insecure. Yeah. Um, because again, you got to remember, Joe, the perspective of the average high elo player, right? Think of the average high elo player that is... Play, we're talking GM. They're a GM player, low GM. That guy's put a metric ton of time into the game. They've made sacrifices in other areas of their life to play that many games. And if they're not process oriented and they're a naturally talented gamer, which a lot of them are, well, their narrative is that I'm the best. You know, I'm good. I I, I got to this rank. I'm super good. I've I've made. I've, you know, I've played a shit ton of the game. And um, if this guy is now beating me then he's not just challenging my rank. He's challenging my self-worth. Mm. Like this guy is fully attached to his rank. He's him. Mm. This, this avatar and his name, this rank is him. Cause remember it's not, it's, it's not at the pro it's not, he's not attached to the process. He's, he's, he's attached to the LP. Yeah. He's directly, his self-worth as a person is directly attached to the LP. Mm. When you don't have a growth mindset, that's what your default response is going to be. Mm. So these people, are going to want to put you down to make themselves feel better. Because in that quote you always say, Nathan, hate never comes from above. Ever. Hate always comes from below. People who are above you will not hate you. They'll give you tips. They'll like say, oh, good job. You know, they they just won't. People who are threatened by you are ones that are going to be the most critical of you. All the time. And you got to keep that running in the background. Hence why you just got to disconnect. Disconnect from that entire high elo community. Get off Twitter. Get off Twitter. I've <laughs> taken a note out of Nathan's book. Get off Twitter. Get off Reddit. Nathan's favorite quote: Disengage. Disengage. Get away from it all. Yeah. I mean, these narratives are pointless at the end of the day. Like, you have a level of play. You have mistakes. You have things you're working on. Joe, if he knows that, you're just getting into just crazy. It's just drama or something. Like, what even is it? Like, what does it mean? Well, I think that's normal human psychology. Is like we 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 are going to respond to people around us to, to look for like, I mean, that's what humans do, right? We, we, we listen and we observe and we, we alter our behavior based off what other people are doing, right? We get influenced. I mean, we're not robots. Like, I think it's fair that, I mean, we all get influenced in certain ways. Yeah. You get influenced, but it's just a load of, ho- load of hogwash. Yeah. But that's my yeah. point. Yeah. It's just crap. It's just, but that's against our nature. Our our nature is to respond and adapt to our environment, mm. to what people are saying and mm. listen and just, you know, but you got to, yeah, it's hard. It's not easy. It's really not easy. 
I mean, the moment you start getting into these type of things, you're, you're taking the fun away from the game as well. Like, yeah. yeah. You, you get stuck in this stuff and comparison and talking about LP and rank. You're so just... You're done. Oh, you're, you're, you're done, You're stuck, man. yeah. It's not good. It's hel- it's unhealthy. It's so unhealthy, man. If you ever feel like you're in that rut, you've got to take a break for yeah. the game. You've got to step away. Yeah. Like, that would be my biggest advice. Like, yeah. I've gotten in that rut before many, many times, Joe Life. You've got to take a break. You've got to get off the game and see the real world for a second. Look at the sun. Look, <laughs> yeah. look, at, the, look at the sky. Yeah, you can get into an echo You get into an there. echo. That's what League is. League is a huge... Like, the community is yeah. like a massive... Twitter is the biggest echo chamber mm. that I've ever seen. It's unbelievable. I mean, I, I write one contrarian post mm. and I'm eaten alive. Mm. Even though there wasn't a single good response. Mm. Because everyone wants to jump on the bandwagon of their favorite role model. Mm. It's just a neat, it's just a big dick contest. Whoever has the biggest dick or the most followers wins <laughs> an argument. It's not based on merit. It's not based on the 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 soundness of their argument at all. It's it's you know it's just the way it is at the moment. All right, Curtis, you had another one talking right. about. Um, yeah, so this one's about scaling champions. So this guy wrote to me, emailed me. He's a 17-year-old high schooler, senior from NA. Um, he, he's he been trying to listen to our podcast. And he wants to um, he wants us to talk about like a... I don't, this isn't kind of part of the BBC because he didn't email it to you and Nathan's mail. This went to my mailbag. Your this, is Cur- this is Curtis's this is a special mail. Curtis's mailbag. And directly the hell is this, this new segment that's popped up? <laughs> Why are you guys giving Curtis power on this show? Um, and he said, look, he was he came from the whole classic team diff background, like yeah. just mental blocks. Yeah. And he said this, this is the current mental block that he's really struggling to like deal with. So he says, the, so the mental block I've been having is that I always feel like late game champs are infinitely better than early game champs. And I have several reasons. Clearly, there was a flaw to my logic, but I just can't seem to understand it logically, which is great. That's a great way. It's like, I, there's something not here, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, I, I, what is it though? So this is the first thing. He says, first, it just seems like if you stole out a game and you have a Kale, Cogmore, Lulu, Cassidy, you just auto win games. With that being said, it seems like if you have a Lee Sin, Renekton, Pantheon, or perhaps Assassins or Champs that fall off, you lose because you'll just get outscaled. Of course, this doesn't make sense because so many pro players and amazing players are playing Lee Sin and Renekton and Jace and all these early to mid-game champs are winning and they're literally being played in pro play. Second, while I basically said this in the last point, specifically regarding Lee Sin, I just feel like he's such a horrible champion. I don't understand how people think he's good. He has a slow clear, relatively... Because while Lee can do three or four camps, someone like Kane does six camps, Lee Sin falls off late game, while someone like Kane can serve as an assassin or tank bruiser with CC frontline and dish out lots of reliable damage. If Lee Sin misses Q, he's useless, but even if he lands it, it's like it's like a Yasuo syndrome, and once you go in, you're screwed. He has no reliable CC, unless maybe a flash kick, which, which requires flash, and if anything, you could potentially screw it up for your team by kicking enemy further away. He's supposed to be an early game champ, but can't even 1v1 half the junglers, for example, Xin Zhao, <laughs> Warwick, Mundo, Hecarim, and even champs like Garen in the jungle, yeah, yeah. all of which don't fall off as hard and have something to contribute later into the game. He just has not that good of a gank, etc. So in the end, why is someone like Lee Sin considered considered a good champion? Like if a Lee Sin has 20 CS behind about seven minutes, zero two and a dragon behind, isn't the game just over? Similarly, if Kale has three kills at 10 minutes, how is the game just not over? Third, I progress as a player understanding that CS is very important. My average is about 8.5 CS per minute with Kale, whom I decided to one trick, taking your advice and limiting my champ pool. But for now, Kale, I feel like I'm like, great. I get to scale no matter what. Just stall out. Let me farm. But if you're playing like someone like Katarina, who basically has to miss two or three of the two out of three of the farm in lane, she also just falls off in late game. What is she supposed to do? In other words, why is CS not important on those champs? To me, I get really tilted if I miss one or two minions per wave. But some people are just roaming, sacrificing two or three waves at a time. They start a slow push, then just start roaming. And they basically give the enemy a roam or a freeze. And I'm just trying to understand why is that worth it? Um, so yeah, he basically goes on all this stuff. Which all great so, points. So is this the perspective of... He's a mid laner and he's got like these early game yeah. champs on his team? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Because, uh, I, so let's start with the least in one. You start with the least in one. Okay. Tackle that one, and I'll tackle the other two. Where do you start? Okay, so because I mean, what I have. What's his name? So this is. I have this experience. Uh, Tim. 
Fucking Tim's everywhere. Yeah, Tim's dude. everywhere. Tim's invasion. <laughs> so I mean, I mean, so my initial reaction was to respond to this in terms of you're the one playing the early game champs and you're getting out. No, he's a KO so, one trick okay, mid. Okay, got it. Okay, so okay, so um, in terms of that, so that that's like that you're talking about. Oh, we just insta lose the game because they're scaling and then we're not. Like you know, that's gonna happen a lot. But but actually thinking about how people how you actually win games in practice what you see things it's like sometimes there's like weird map movements so we could create numbers advantages here and it just people just th- throw in if you actually play the game well and you're 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 reading the map and it, it really doesn't matter because at the end of the day at in that gets to a fight before a cane even if he's so much stronger you you've like got you've set up this fight you've set up the vision here or something well you win it and scaling doesn't matter in a way like, like the, whenever I hear those type of statements, they're thinking of like in isolation. In, a, in, in like a perfect in world. In a perfect, it's like 5v5. But like, that's not the reality of how solo queue works. Like what, what I mean, the way that's happening is that person, what ELO is he? He sent me his OBG, but I haven't clicked on the link. I can't click it because I screenshotted it. Oh, shit. Um, because low elo players will default. I mean, your default is to 5v5 all the time. Oh, so he since then he's climbed to about platinum MMR from being hard okay, stuck silver two. Yep, there we go. So he was stuck in silver. Now he's like platinum MMR. He says. Yeah. So means. he's probably in situations more so where it's just going to be a 5v5, and yeah, that that he's going to have a lot of experience of losing those. Well, leasing his... does objectively suck in gold. Right? That too as well. Yes. Like that's just true. That like it yeah, just because right. he's difficult yeah. to execute. Period. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, first of all, to help him, like, what are the strengths of Lee Sin, Nathan? What makes Lee Sin so good? And why is Lee Sin always around no matter what, every year, year in, year out? He's just a fantastic fighter. Like, you know, he they said they don't, but he wins 2v2s and 3v3s, like, so hard. Like, counter ganks, like, he's so... F- mobile. 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 You can jump over every wall. His terrain scaling is incredible. Like, Q and W. Yeah. Like, think about a counting gank. Like, releasing counting ganks are the most deadliest things in the history and, of And all Legends. Lee Sin, I swear Lee Sin getting one or two kills, like, it's so hard to deal with. Especially with Gore Drinker. Like, in my experience, when a Lee yeah. Sin gets, In like, your games, yeah. In my games, if yeah. a Lee Sin gets ahead, it's just, I, I have mental block. I don't know what to do. So, yeah, it obviously depends. Like, we got to put himself in, in, in his shoes in terms of... Um, which is hard for us to do because we mm. don't play in that, you know, mm. in terms of that, like, games. But, well, because champs like Warwick and Zinza, they just are better. Objectively, they are better at that rank because a they're easier to execute. execute yeah, they don't require fancy mechanics or anything like that. Ga- fights are larger. Just hurt the run into river <laughs> front on just bang. Like there's I, no. I, I wouldn't even say it's about late game scan. It's it's the ease of execution. Yeah, that's what it actually is. It's like Zinza doesn't objectively. It doesn't even really scale, but it does in gold. It, it like, scales because of execution. Because yeah. in so in, in terms of execution, like it's just. He has this huge ult that's going to split the fight and yeah. just press one button. Yeah. And same with Kane. Kane, Kane is pretty more. easy to execute, especially Red Kane specifically. Um, but I think he doesn't really understand as well what a what a jungler, like an early game skirmish a jungler can do that has the, like has path flexibility, has terrain scaling. He, he, I view Lee Sin as like the, um, he's like the bread and butter jungler. Like he's like, he doesn't excel in any one area. Mm. He's like good across the board. Yeah. And having that flexibility is really important. And especially in high elo. And something, Tim, you'll figure out. And I've had this question a lot actually in my MLA regards to um, why does like having playing champs that have options, why is it better? That's why I think Zoe, for example, is so good because you have so many options. And that's like kind of ties into what I was going to say, why, why early game champs are better is because you have more options. So view this, all right? I, I, this, is, this is how I would view it. Imagine, um, let's say Kale has, you know, there is, you have one option to win this game. You're going to sit here and you're going to farm. And and even if they can't stop you from farming, that's okay. Like you're just going to farm. You have like this very clear track. It's like this one option and it's going to work in lower ELO a lot because games are going to be elongated. Yep. But you just have this one option. You can't roam. You can't like invade. You can't set up like a dive. You can't gank anyone. You can't set up a freeze into setting up. Like, you can't do anything, right? So you're just there. You like this like one option. Yeah. One option. You do this one option really well, and it's yeah. pretty reliable. Yeah. But then you take a champ like, Fizz. say, F- yeah, TF. TF. Yeah. Um, I mean, any lane dominant, just Syndra. 
I mean, anything that can just win lane hard, Zoe. And then it's like, oh, I can do so many things. I can slow build into dive top. I can I can bounce, freeze it on my side, set up a gank. I can um, shove this one in tempo, reset, roam bot. I can call for this rift held on top side with my top prior. These are these are all options, and when you view it like this, if you and and because league is a game that is so chaotic, and you don't actually know how the game is going to play out, having options beca- actually comes in handy a hell of a lot. Mm. Hence why I can't stand playing a champion like Vlad or Cassidy or Katarina because my options are so limited. I have so little options. I want to have as many options as possible so I can adapt to all the differing game paces and all the differing scenarios. Lee Sin has that flexibility. Mm. Lee Sin can adapt mm. to any type of game pace mm. and any type of game and any win con. He can just do it well. He can peel. He can dive. He can facilitate. He can dive sides well. He can invade early if he wants. He can do so many different things. So flexibility is a, is a key component of early game. And it, it, okay, another, I want to give you another analogy. Let's say we're doing NASCAR, you know, those cars that go around. And let's say there's two different cars. Let's just say there's one car that is like really economical, right? And it, it doesn't have to like refuel. It just will go around at a steady pace throughout the entire race. And as, if, if you don't like make a mistake, you're just going to win. Like you're just going to like go around and around and around and around. You just don't have to do anything fancy. But then there's like a car next to you that it's actually, it's got like less grip maybe, or like a little bit like, maybe it's got like, um, you know, the handling and it's good. It requires a little bit more handling, but it's way faster. And it's also equally economical. Mm. So you would say, well, at a higher level, if we're really pro drivers, I would probably rather that faster car that is a little bit harder to handle because I'm just going to win every time if I can master that strategy. Mm. That's the way you got to view it. In low, lower ELO, when people are, like don't have, they can't get the handle of the car, that re- really reliable, easy to execute car that doesn't have to do anything, they're just going to win. But in high, in the higher ranks of the professional drivers, they're going to want that faster car that is harder because they want that speed. Yeah. That's the way you got to view it. So what you're experiencing, Tim, at lower ELO in gold, that's very normal. You want, games are going to be stored out longer. They're going to be more ARAMs, classic front to back team fight. And people don't know how to translate leads at that rank. They're not going to stack dragons. They're not going to get Rift Heralds on spawn. They're not going to invade, dive sides, stack waves. No one's going to do that shit. So you can get away with it. But in terms of learning the game, sometimes, like, and I teach people like fundamentals with champions in gold, you're actually better off learning this stuff in gold sometimes rather than playing Malzahar blindly to Platinum 4. Because when you get to Platinum 4 and the game actually does change a little bit, well, it's going to be a pretty big shock, isn't it? I would rather you slowly learn these things in gold than just play spam, sit under Tower Castle and in level 16 brain dead herder. Then and it, you know, I'd get that out, done. Leave that. Don't mm. even go down that rabbit hole because then you're just gonna have expectations about your level of play. Yeah, yeah I would say um, the biggest thing. I mean, this is my huge trap for me last season when I was in Diamond. Mm. Just rigid thinking, like mm. we just instantly lose the game because we have an early game champion. Thing like the perfect example of that is just Sybil. Just I love the way he views Sybil, the game. Yeah. There, you know, like. He will win a game. I love the way he plays. That looks unwinnable, you know? Like, Civil wins games all the time. Because he doesn't think that way. He thinks, he always think he can make, I mean, he's playing champs like Elise. Well, like Zach, so what right? Sybil understands inherently is he understands that players aren't perfect. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, he, and he, he understands chaos beautifully. Yeah. Yeah. Like he, understands, he understands what people won't expect. Yeah. And he does the thing that people least expect <laughs> every time. And when you get good at that, anything's winnable. Yeah. Because of shutdowns and shit. Yeah, when when you've done it so many times as well, then the narrative just breaks. So like, I mean, and again, he's the one sitting there playing KO. Right? Sybil's so. not like that high elo, but I I'm most scared of him mm. to verse because any game is no game is mm. gonna be a free win versus mm. Sybil, no matter what, mm. no matter what he's doing. Even if he gets zero three behind in the early game, he's gonna find a way to bring you bring back into that game. Mm. But I I counter Sybil though, me specifically because I remember I know exactly. Because I know his reading. mindset. Yeah, like, okay. I know what he's looking for. Yeah, he's get like, I remember, I remember a game where I was, I think I was playing Cassio into him or something. And I knew that he does this every time when, when you get Baron versus Sybil, mm. he will always tell his him to camp a bush uh, on the side yeah, lane as yeah. you're shoving at the sides. Yeah. 
and everyone else just showing butt Sybil. Yeah. And he's playing Elise, I think. Yeah. And I just knew, even though it made no sense for him to stay there for that long, but I just knew that So he, your team got Baron. And yeah. Then he's and we're all coming waiting. back onto the map. Yeah. And I'm, I knew Sybil was going to make a play, mm. but then the rest of their team showed butt him. Mm. And then I'm, I'm like, I, I, I swear he's going to try and one shot, catch me off on the side as I catch it sideways. Mm. I, I just know it. Mm. And he was sitting and like, and what I did, I started to shove out. And then what I did, I just like waited there. I just like, so I just waited there. He kept waiting there and mm. he's still he not showing. To walk up. Waiting, waiting, waiting. And, and then finally, like I walk up, but then my team's backing me up now. And then he shows and he, and he tries to kill me. Yeah. And he, we waited there for like a minute. Yeah. I knew, and, and everyone would die there. Everyone would die there apart from and think somebody about, knows Sybil. And, and think about it. They're on the back foot. Yeah, i got to change yeah. the battery. They're on the back foot. Um, because, I mean, again, he's, he's behind. You've got Baron. Yeah. But he can make a play to get back. And then that's Because everyone else is usually switched off by now. So no yeah. one... No it's one, like, oh, we got Baron. We've we got Baron. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, TLDR, Tim, look, I think that what you're, you're failing to understand is that how many options people have when, when you're playing an early game champion. When I'm playing a champ like Kale, why I think Kale is one of the worst mids in the game, actually, mm. is that you have very, 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 yeah, very, right. very little options. Yeah. And you're purely relying on the mistakes of the enemy, which works really well in low elo mm. because everyone makes mistakes. Mm. You're getting a free scale. But when the game gets harder and people become more competent, what are they going to do? They're going to start shoving you in, dive side. Your team's going to flame you for sitting Forcing on the tower. On crab and, then, river. and you've got to try and make up for that in mid game, but that's hard to do. That's very difficult to do the higher you get. The better people are at translating leads, stacking Rift Holds, stacking Dragons. It, the game's largely not up to you. I literally tell people who play these champs, you're relying on the incompetence of the enemy. And, yeah. and that's a way of playing the yeah. game. It's just stylistically. How much chance... This is what your job looks like. you got to do your job well here. And this is how it looks like. It, and then it comes down to stylistic differences. Do you want to play that type of game? Mm. That's ultimately up to you. Uh, should we jump into yep. mailbag? Let's do it. Away we go! Jingle, jingle, jingle song. That first question here is from Calvin. First world's experience question. So it's his first world. How exciting is that? He's like, well, what's this event? This is a big deal. Everyone's hyping it up and everything, you know? <laughs> Cool production and lots of viewers. You want to see the view? Can like, whoa. Uh, hi, guys and Nathan. I'm watching Worlds for the first time. I have a few questions that I'm curious about. So we'll do them one by one. Why do all top and mid laners run teleport? I see it even on some kill champs like LeBlanc and Zed, which I pretty much only see Ignite on in my games. I get that they need to play as a team, but what does this do to these champs' play style? Uh, this a quick one. Um, TP is again. It's like it's like flexibility. It's like options. Mm. That's why you got to view that summoner. It's like, I mean, don't don't think of TP as oh, I have TP now. I can split push. That's like literally the last usage of it. Actually, it's more. I now, if a fight breaks out in the side, if you look at even um, the games from yesterday with uh, Damon versus Mad, this is what happened. Uh, Showmaker took really good trades into Humanoid, um, forced Humanoid to go back to base, and then so Humanoid doesn't miss too many too much creeps. He uses TP as a crutch to TP back to lane and be like, okay, now I don't miss anything. It's like a get out of jail free card. Mm. Then what happens now? Showmaker, because he got to conserve his TP, bot lane had a two v two all in. Showmaker TPs picks up a kill. So that's two different usages of TP. One as a, as like a quote unquote get out of jail free card to collect farm without getting far behind. So you take a bad trade. Oh, I can I can come back. The second one is reacting to a potential two v two in a side lane. That's just two of the many usages. Hmm. Um, so TP think of it as flexibility options. Options, yeah. I mean, the game changes so much from a jungler's perspective when mid laners have TP. Like in hmm. my games, I literally had to make a learning objective this you, year. Sometimes you can't dive sides. Because yeah, I, like I have to track. You can't gank. I have to track. Like even though I have priority in top, um, it's like a really good counter gank. It doesn't matter because well, think of it as like TFR. Literally, yeah. Or Shen R. Yeah. It's the same thing. It's it's unbelievable how strong teleport is. Teleport is broken by concept. It's broken. Yeah, it shouldn't broken be in the concept. game. Yeah, it really is broken by concept. I wish it. Or, was or removed. you shouldn't allow like the mid positions to take it. I feel you know. Nah, you can't take it anyway. It should just be removed. I don't. I really? genuinely don't that think it's healthy for the game. Top so much, dude. Think about if teleport was removed. From it would the game. be amazing. I think the game would be way what cooler. The, you really reckon, dude? Yeah. Top would be uh, Curtis. Top. Yeah, it'd, top's it'd be dangerous brutal. though because top would snowball. 
so hard. It would. Like, because the lane's so long, it takes so long to get to top lane. True, it actually would be game breaking. I think it would be out, it would be out of control. No, you would have to change the how meta. Much... The meta would be screwed in top forever. No, you would have to change the, how much you get from a kill, or you would have to change the way waves work in top lane specifically. That's true. You would have to do something like that. I don't that's know how. Weird, that's it. Yeah, that's, that's a complex not symmetrical thing. shit. It seems like League have got themselves into a hole here. <laughs> you got to need it. You kind of need you it. You do need it. The map's too big. Well, to be honest with you, actually, a lot of tops don't even take it in my games. A lot of them go flash ignite. Look at the most high low players in OS right now. Yeah. A lot of the Fiora players go flash ignite because the, what they've what, what, what this is what they've realized. They're TP ignite, don't they? No, they will literally go flash Bullshit. ignite. Yeah. Look at their yeah, OBGs. Because yeah. what I asked get back about yeah, this, yeah. and he was saying how. Um, if you face um, one of these laners that, I mean, sometimes they go flash uh, TP Ignite, but a lot, not, a lot of champs can't do that. If you don't have Ignite, like a lot of, say, for example, Darius, they just go Ghost Ignite. That's go, yeah, Ghost and, Flash. And, and it's like, well, they realize that if the enemy doesn't, or Riven goes flash, a lot of Rivens just go flash Ignite. Because mm. they, they, if they get that one kill, that's all they need. And yeah, if they realize if the that enemy doesn't... Sense. If the enemy doesn't go it, yeah. they just win trade. So the threat of the Ignite is enough to get lane control That's to right. fix their yes, way states. Yeah. So it, it actually doesn't matter. No, but Curtis, I'm saying, I'm not saying it from those Chopper champs' perspective. I'm thinking it would be impossible to play tanks top. Yeah, tanks would die. That would be gone. They? So the meta will be 100% stilled. Yeah, tanks Fiora, would just die. Fiora, like... Imagine if that was the Riven, case, though. Imagine if they made it, it was champ Darius. dependent. What? Imagine if they made ah. t- like you could only take TP for a certain champion. Yeah, that would be insane. No, like TP top is fine. TP mid is not fine. That's my perspective. Yeah, but how could you? How could you govern that? Like I, it wouldn't. Again, the yeah. champion you pick, or if you're in the mid lane role, you can't pick TP if you're in That's, mid. Yeah. Then it's weird in terms of swapping. But then they'll shit. just swap. Eh, it's just weird. I don't know. I mean, I, I think that mid TP, mid TP, is like an element to track as well in terms of people climbing. Like I had to deal with. I said I had a platinum review session and I had to deal with a fucking mid TP. I only talk about this in highly reviews, but I had to do it in this. You I'm just like, don't Nathan, you just ignore it, just lose the game. Yeah, yeah. Tell the that's what to I lose did. I did. I yeah. told him this is pointless. I don't want you to think about yep. this to track it at all. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's like fine. it's like tracking. It's, it's, it's like tracking it's, support it's rooms in gold and, and plat. Like a lot of the time, I said no, just don't. Yeah, don't worry about just it. Don't worry about it too much. It's like you just can't. It's too much. It's ridiculous though, in a way. I think it should be. Mid-laners I mean, it's like, it's like, it's like when, no, well, it's the same thing for my mid lane is you just die to this gank. It's like, you're just going to die and you just go lose game. Oh, fuck, right, like man. I, I have a, this is a classic one. I've got a guy sent me a clip today. He's playing Malzahar. Yeah. His leasing goes into the river. Yeah. He's match prior with yeah. the RE. Yeah. But he's like Zach, the enemy Zach just dies onto the leasing in the scuttle. Mm. And then like, he's there, but leasing just dies. And then the RE got double buffs and now his lane's done. I mean, yep, you just lose the game. That's, it's a good mindset. That's healthy. Just lose Everyone, the game. That's out of your control. Yeah. You can't do anything about yeah. that. I am happy with that mindset. You don't get upset about that. That's fine. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, sometimes you just got to say well played as well. Yeah, right? sometimes like, it's like, well, well yeah, unlucky. He, he played well. Played well. That's it. All right, the next question is, next, how does everyone get such ridiculous vision scores? I swear there aren't that many wards to place and kill even in a challenger game. There's a lot of warding going on. There's a yeah. shit ton of warding. Like, yeah. Like the, the the supports are resetting an unbelievable amount compared to what you see in solo queue, by the way. Well, what you okay? So the one that you got to realize, what I learned from Cupcake, is that in bot lane, all that's happening is this. All that's happening is that one team has lane control, they stack a wave, tempo reset. Then the other one, they come back, their jungle hovers, they stack a wave, tempo reset. The the bot lanes are just resetting basically permanently. So mm. the supports are just yeah, just roaming everywhere and getting some wards. Young, everyone's just warding on cooldown. <laughs> when I play off roll support and I get I, I, I get out of base, I get full vision control, and then something happens. I actually have Into time to base. reset again and they get those three wards up. I have they clearing all those wards, but I have three wards, four wards in my inventory ready to go. It's like game winning stuff, dude. That's yeah. that's one of the most exciting things as a support yeah, player. Yeah. Nothing, nothing's happened, <laughs> no fights happened, but I've got to reset off. To so get you're the up, refresh you're like up in vision yeah. because of it. Yeah. That I already placed. Like I have this fresh vision area, like I'm at Baron and I had time and they to have do no another sweepers. one. No sweepers. No, well, they would sweep it, but I'm ready to go to replace ward straight away. But now they have no sweepers. Yeah, now so they have now no sweepers. Yeah, nothing they can do. That's right. It's great. You know? oh, that's my favorite part. So that's the answer to that question. Um, it says, lastly, and probably most important is, is there anything to gain from esports to aid in your solo queue journey? I'm really happy to see my main champ misfortune being picked or banned status, but it's hard to follow because they pan the camera everywhere. I don't plan to watch 
uh, esports, but if there are valuable benefits, then I'll be willing to put some time aside for it. I mean, if you had ProView... I think AD Carry is actually probably one of the few roles... Bot, I would say bot lane is actually probably one of the few roles where you would. What? I feel, like, I feel like mid and jungle are so... And top as well. Like mid jungle top is so different. Like I would say mid is just a... It's just a different game. Yeah. It is so different. Jungle is also a different game as well. So you can barely get anything. Um... Because jungle's all about reacting, tracking, and reacting yeah. to them, and, and mid lane, trading sides and stuff. That oh, doesn't really happen in solo queue. The lanes are just very different. So yeah. AD carry, you could see how they trade, and like the way they play their their waves. Really, the only thing to get out of it is just builds. But to be honest, you would get the same learning from solo queue watching these plays in solo queue. So I wouldn't bother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's best to again, but it's best to watch high elo pov solo queue. Solo queue. That's the best. That's always the best. All right, next question here is from... I don't know what this is name. It's like some Russian name or something, and it's okay. like all the things. He's from the MLA, though. <laughs> you know <laughs> you know he's from the MLA, but you can't read his name. No. Nah. Okay. Weird Lost Streak. Hey, Curtis and Nathan. Oh, I am Carito. Oh, it's Carito from the MLA. Oh, there we go. Oh, I've sent the email title. <laughs> <laughs> um, I play mid lane and a proud member of the MLA. These days in solo queue have been really weird for me. I was basically plat two and all the work I've done with Coach Curtis paid off, but suddenly I got lost, completely forgot my learning objectives and basically got demoted to platinum four. I honestly don't know how to handle a lost streak. I reviewed games, spot out trends, but nothing really seemed to work for me. I've lost all my motivation since I was at the peak of my season and I wanted to push further. I went back to where I've been the whole year. Thanks a lot. He's got an amazing show. So he's been beaten down. He's back. He is that, that, that is, that hurts. Mm. Like, mm. you know, you do all this great work with Curtis, you know, yes. And then it just, you get derailed mm. and then back down. You're like, fuck, I did all that to get to Now I've got to get all the way back there. It's demoralizing. I would say step number one, Take the learnings. I would say go figure out why did that happen in the first place. It says that, mm. it, like, I wouldn't really worry about where you are now. Just for reflection of your yeah, season. For like, next, for next so then year, how do yeah. I make sure that doesn't happen again? What, what did I do? Did I just start playing 15-game blocks? Well, the, the thing with Critter, he plays Aurelia. Okay. And, like, climbing with Aurelia, it's a, it's a brutal thing because it's it's just skirmish execution a lot of the time. Yeah. It's like, it's like yeah, he, he this guy, he can, I've seen, like, when I do our reviews, mm. his lane is great. Like, mm. he can get a lead. Mm. He can kill people. Mm. And then it's just that that next push from Platinum to the D4 with skirmishing. It's just that next level. Mm. And it's really hard. It really is hard. Like you're playing a champ that, you know, it really is just mechanics max in many areas. And you got to be that 1v9 type carry with Aurelia. Mm. That's just what you are. Mm. And it's brutal. And But you got to embrace it. You got to learn to love that. Like you... You got to have a very unique mind, a very different mindset when you're climbing with something like a you know, Aurelia. Is there an equivalent for that in in jungle, like a oh, Carthus or something dude. like? Absolutely, dude. Nidalee, Nidalee, yeah. Kindred, Graves, like you got to be really good at skirmishing. Like Lee Sin, and like, the games are just lost, Java. right? Off yeah, of skirmish, absolutely, just yeah. Done. Yeah, you can do all these great things. You can get a lead, yeah. but you can undo it so fast. Yeah. And it's the same thing with Aurelia. Like he, he's doing a great job. And then he always asks me like, how do I translate leads? And what's like, keep farming, keep farming your Raptors, get ahead. You know, there's going to be a, some form of skirmish. As long as you're there at that skirmish, great. Um, get into the side lane, great. You know, just be there for the fights. And like, I think what's happened likely is that he had a few rough games and then he lost his confidence. It's because a champ like that, when you lose confidence, mm. you are done. done. You're, you're going to play with confidence. You're finished. <laughs> yeah. Like imagine no confidence in Italy or no confidence at least in. You're just oh, done. Oh, yeah. If you can't hit a Q or something. Yeah. Yeah. When I lost the confidence with Java and EQs, whoo, you don't want to see my next couple of games You're there. done. Yeah. And because you don't hit a stun on Aurelia, yeah. you're done. Yeah. You don't commit to that one play that you need to clean up on, you're done. And that's just the nature of the champions. You got to you, first of all, you got to embrace that and learn to love it. Like mm. you're not gonna, it's there is no other way around it. You've picked a champ that is inherent. That's just the nature of the kit. Love it. Get into the details. Like Nathan said, I think calib- like calibrating on and reflecting on why it happened is absolutely crucial. Yeah. 
and then we'll use the off season to really get you back to where you were and above that. You know, I don't think it will be that hard given that you've already been there. It's it's just you got to. So usually, what I found is that people will drop, and then their their skill gap will be so large that they will inevitably start winning again. Get that confidence back up. You'll get to plateau again, and then you'll be at that plateau point in which we're going to have to just get into the details. Look at your get skirmish optimization. Is it a threat assessment issue? Is it a jungle awareness issue? Is it you're not grouping up for fights enough? What is it exactly? And then we'll just get into that. Get into the details. There has to be something. And sometimes you need a coaching session, man. All right, next question here is from The Unwanted. The Not Wanted. I don't think there's any other name here. Okay. Uh, coaching slash helping friends. Question. Howdy. Howdy, Curtis and Nathan. Howdy. I've been playing league with my buddies for a long time, and we've always been about the same rank together, around silver one, gold four. Last year, I started listening to the podcast and have been doing the three block strategy and reviewing every game this season. It has really helped me focus during games and improve over the course of the season and then platinum now. Uh, once I got that shiny new rank badge, my friends started asking me to coach them, but I really didn't feel qualified to offer advice. I know I still have some bad habits that I want to improve, and I feel like if I tried helping them, then they'd pick up some some of the same habits. I always say to just watch Coach Curtis, Soul 2, BBC, and follow your process, but they want me to tell them what to do during the games, like a niece video. Oh, so they want to do like a live coaching session. I know Curtis has voiced his opinion on that style in the past, but do you think it would be beneficial for them if we do it consistently rather than a one-time event? Uh, I want to help them since they're my buddies, but I also don't want to like mess them up, mess them up because and cause them to fail. It's in a bit of a pickle. Yeah. Well, we're going back to the relatability of journey. Like, so I mean, the way you could frame it mm. is like, hey. These are like my bad habits, right? I mean, I don't know if he knows if these bad habits or not, but yeah, if that's, he, the, danger that's the danger, right? So like, let's say if he knew, it's like, these are my bad habits, but this is again what works for me, you know? But like, you know what? If, if, if you're still telling them some advice and like to help them, I'm sure it's something... Yeah, will, something will click. Like they're going to have bad habits regardless in a yeah, way. You know what I mean? Like, like the bad habit's that. a bad habit. Yeah. Like, I think you can't really do too much harm. Yeah, I agree. As long as it's not live coaching. Yeah. Like if you just help them with their reviews, like you get into a review. You with want one them, of them to make them critically think themselves. That the goal at the end of the day, yeah, you're spot on, Nathan. You got the goal at the end of the day is to get them to play with as much intention as possible. Mm. Such that when you get into the review, you're gonna at least at least they've they've thought something. Yeah. So then you can get better at it. Yep. That's it. And you can point them in a right direction, in a, in a, in a rough direction. And a, sometimes any direction is better than no direction. Even if you're wrong or slightly, only slightly correct, that's fine. Yeah, just, I mean, it's great to just have a, have com fun, com yeah, conversation. Have a conversation. Just explore. Like, like the key thing, like when Ishan said that really helped him was reviewing with other members. Like he wasn't reviewing with challenger players, diamond players as well. But they were sort of just like figuring it out together. Yeah. Like, like, what are the other alternatives? What are the options? Again, even if you have the wrong or the right answer, it's the thinking. Usually, like this works is not working. You, is it working? Yeah. Like, you, you just have you, a thought. You'll be able to come up with... I think most of the time, players can actually come up with the correct solution if they think about it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Eventually. Eventually as Eventually. Well. Yeah. Yeah. And there's no harm in doing that. Um, as long as you come... You, again, as long as your mindset is like that of curiosity, as long as you're not coming in with this do this or else type yeah. mentality. Yeah. Like this is what you have to do every single time. Mm. Like just come in with a sense of curiosity, you know, a sense of open-mindedness, a student, not mindset, just having a crack. As long as that's your mindset, you're playing with intention, with intensity, you're going to make some form of improvement. As long as you're pushing the same messages, chant mastery, playing with intensity, reviewing three blocks, they're going to get somewhere if they're playing. That's it. And they want to improve. Um, but the, when it comes to live, the live coaching, the reason I'm so big on that not being the way to go is because you're ruining the learning cycle. You're preventing them from having their own hypothesis. I get what your intention is. It's like, it's to, to, to help their initial hypothesis, but 
or complete maybe the learning cycle in the game. No, let it happen and let, let it happen free flow naturally. Let them have make their own mistakes. They have to make their own mistakes. It's the only way you're going to learn. They, they have to be able to do it by themselves. Mm. Nice isn't going to be there to watch their, their game every single time, mm. is he? So that's just not the way to go. They have to be able to learn to make mistakes and get comfortable with learning mistakes and then get comfortable with identifying those mistakes with you in the review. That's the way to go. Yeah, you get it. I mean, they got to come up with that review process. Really important. Um, it's the same reason as why I don't like doing doing. Mm. You don't know who made the decision or not. Was it your buddy there influencing you to go to that jungle fight? Or was it you? Who was it? I mean, if you can't take responsibility for a basic mistake, then you, you're screwed. That's why dueling's not good. anti duo in the... anti duo anti-live review. In the Broken by Concept universe. Yep. Well, right, that's it. Anything else to add on here, Curtis? Clips, book club. We're doing... If anyone wants to get into the book club, they better do it now because there's going to be a new book next month. Yep, that's right. Um, so there's that. That's pretty much it, man. We taught, We already know the next book, Meditations, Meditations, right? yeah, Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius, Aurelius a good Meditations. One. Um, exciting. exciting. Yeah, very exciting. Very exciting. All right, good work, everyone. Let's keep on improving in our ranked end of season, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.